Well, hello, Penrise students, and welcome along to part five of David Attenborough. We left it last time with them managing to corner a caiman, which is very similar to a crocodile and an alligator, and they cornered it, like in this picture here, and they were trying to get it out of the hole in the hope of capturing it as well as filming it. And we left it at a very tense moment as to whether they're going to be able to do it or not, and whether someone might get hurt. So, at this point... By now, there were some 20 locals watching the proceedings and offering suggestions. To them, it seemed incomprehensible that we should wish to catch the creature alive and unharmed. They were in favour of dispatching it there and then with their knives, so obviously killing it. At last, with the aid of two forked sticks to hold the noose wide open, Jack and Teddy coaxed the lasso round the caiman's black snout. This plainly infuriated the beast. With a twist and a roar, it shook the noose off. Three times the rope was on, and three times it was shaken off. It went round a fourth time. Slowly with the sticks, Jack eased it up towards the caiman's head. Then suddenly, before the reptile realised what was happening, he drew the noose tight and the dangerous jaws were secured. I think I'm right in saying is, although they've got a very powerful bite, they can't open their jaws very easily. So when you actually put something round it, it does keep them closed. Now we had to guard against a blow from its huge tail. The situation began to look more alarming from where Charles and I were standing, for, having tied another noose round the caiman's jaws for safety, Teddy told the Wapishana to uproot the palisade. There was nothing now but open water between Charles and me and the caiman, which lay with its long head projecting out of the hole, glaring at us malevolently with yellow unblinking eyes. Jack, however, jumped down from the bank into the, bank into the water immediately in front of the hole, taking with him the long pole he had cut from a sapling. Bending down, he pushed the pole into the tunnel so that it lay along the reptile's scaly back, and reaching inside, he secured it by tying a half hitch round the pole and under the animal's clammy armpits. Teddy joined him, and inch by inch they drew the caiman out of its hole, tying half hitches around its body and onto the sapling as it emerged. The back legs, the base of the tail, and finally the tail itself were securely tied, and the animal lay safely trussed at our feet, the muddy water lapping around its jaws. It was just ten feet long, which is just over three metres, and you say just, that's enormous. It had now to be ferried across the lake to the trucks. We hitched the front end of the pole to the stern of the dugout canoe, and towing the caiman behind us, we paddled back to the women's encampment. Jack supervised the Wapishana as they helped us to load the caiman onto the truck, and then he methodically inspected its bonds one by one to see that none was chafing, which means like rubbing it and causing it pain. The women, having no fish to cure, gathered round the truck, examining our capture and trying to decide why on earth anybody should value such a dangerous pest. We drove off back across the savannas. Charles and I sat on each side of the caiman with our feet six inches of its jaws, uh, off its jaws, trusting that the rawhide lassoes were as strong as they were reputed to be. We were both jubilant at having caught such an impressive creature so early. Jack was less demonstrative. Not bad, he said, for a start. Which is a good place as we move into chapter two. And there it is, Tiny McTurk and the Cannibal Fish. Cannibal is something which eats its own kind. So that's an interesting name for a bit of fish. Let's read on. After a week on the savannas, we found, rather to our surprise, that we had assembled quite a large menagerie, which is a great word. It almost means like a collection of animals. We had captured a giant anteater. The vaqueros had bought us many kinds of animals, and Teddy Melville had contributed by giving us several of the pets that roamed around his house. Robert, a raucous macaw, which is a type of parrot, two trumpeter birds which had been living semi-domesticated lives among the chickens, and Chiquita, his capuchin monkey, who, though very tame, had the trying habit of slyly stealing things from our pockets when we were innocently playing with her. That's where you get, like, what a little monkey. Those are all worth looking up later, by the way. At the end of this video, I always give you, like, a little something to look at. Well, look up those different types of animals. So you, what you need to be doing as you're listening to me is trying to picture all this in your head. Well, what you want to do is maybe make that picture easier by Googling it as well. With our collection of animals well established in Tim's care, we decided to extend our search beyond the immediate neighbourhood of Letham and visit Caranambo, 60 miles away to the north. Caranambo was the home of Tiny McTurk, the rancher who had invited us to stay with him when we had met him on our third day in Georgetown. 
We said goodbye to Tim and climbed into a borrowed Jeep and set off. Excuse me, I'm just trying to move this up a little bit so it's clear. After three hours driving through the scrubby, featureless savannas, we saw on the horizon a belt of trees lying across the line of the trail we were following. There was no sign of a gap or a clearing to suggest there was a way through, and it looked as if the track must dwindle and peter out. We were sure that we had lost our way, but then we saw that the path plunged straight into the trees, down a narrow, gloomy tunnel, just wide enough to admit our jeep. The tree trunks on either side were interwoven with small bushes and lianas, and branches met overhead to form an almost solid ceiling. All sounds a bit spooky. Then, unexpectedly, sunshine flooded down on us. The belt of bush ended as suddenly as it had begun, and in front of us was the Caranambo, a group of mud and brick and thatched houses sprinkled around a wide, gravelled clearing and interspersed with groves of mangoes, cashews, guavas and lime trees. So those are all different types of fruit trees. I can tell you, mango is absolutely delicious when it's fresh. Tiny and Connie McTurk had heard the jeep and had come out to greet us. Tiny was tall and fair and dressed in an oily khaki drill shirt and trousers, for we had interrupted him in his workshop where he was fashioning new iron arrowheads. Connie, shorter, slim and neat in blue jeans and blouse, greeted us warmly and showed us into the house. We then entered one of the most curious rooms I have ever visited. It seemed to contain a world of its own, the old and primitive and the new and mechanical a microcosm of life in this part of the world. Room, perhaps, is not entirely accurate a word, for, on two adjoining sides, it was open to the sky, the bounding walls being only two foot high. Straddling the top of one of them was a leather saddle, and, just outside, a long wooden rail carried four outboard engines, which are the sort you get on uh, small boats. Behind the wooden walls on the other two sides of the room lay the bedrooms. A table against one of these walls was covered with radio apparatus, with which Tiny maintained contact with Georgetown and the coast, and by the side of it stood a large set of shelves crammed with books. On the other wall hung a large clock and barbaric assortment of guns, crossbows, longbows, arrows, blowpipes, fishing lines and wapishana feather headdresses. In the corner we noticed a stack of paddles and an American What's that say? A Meri Meri Indian. That's a new word for me. An American Indian earthware jug full of cool water. In place of the in the place of chairs, there were the three large, gaily coloured Brazilian hammocks slung across the corners of the room, and in the centre, its feet embedded deep in the hard packed mud floor, stood a giant table about three yards long. Above us, on one of the beams, hung a line of orange-coloured maize heads, and here and there, stretching across the beams, a few planks provided a spasmodic semblance of a ceiling. We looked around admiringly. Not a nail in the place, said Tiny proudly. When did you build it, we asked. Well, after the Great War, so that's like the First World War, I messed about in the interior, washing for diamonds in the northwest, hunting, digging for gold and that sort of thing, and then I thought it was time I settled down. I already made one or two trips up the Rupinini River. In those days we did it by boats up the rapids, and it took us sometimes a fortnight and sometimes a month, according to the state of the river. I thought it was a nice sort of country, not too many people, you know, and I decided to make it my home. I came up the river looking for a place that was on high ground so that I should be above the Kabura flies and wouldn't have difficulties with drainage, and which was also near enough to the river to enable me to bring all my stores and things up from the coast by boat. Of course this house is really only a temporary one. I put it up in a rather hurry while I was lying, uh, laying out the plans and getting up all the materials to build a really fancy residence. I have still got all the plans in my mind and all the materials in the outhouse, and I could start building it tomorrow. But somehow, he added, avoiding Connie's eye, I don't ever seem to get uh, started on it. Connie laughed. He's been saying that for 25 years, she said, but y'all will be hungry, so let's sit down and eat. She moved over to the table and motioned to us to sit down. Around the table, there were five upended orange boxes. I apologise for those terrible old things, said Tiny. They're not nearly as good as the orange boxes we used to get before the war. You see, we once had chairs, but this floor is rather uneven, and the chairs are always breaking their legs. Boxes haven't got any legs to break, so they might last much longer, and really, they are just as comfortable. Meals with the McTurks were rather complicated. 
Connie had the reputation of being one of the finest cooks in Guyana, and certainly the meal she put in front of us was magnificent. It started with lake, um, steaks of Lucanini, a delicate tasting fish, which... It's making me hungry, this is. So we'll talk about the meal in a second. Um, but look, there's the picture of him uh, interviewing them too. I don't know if you can quite make it out. There he is and there she is, both lying in the hammock while he's recording them. Tiny regularly caught below the house, talking about the fish here in the Rubinini River. Roast duck followed. Tiny had shot them the previous day, and the meal ended with the fruit from the trees outside. But competing for the food were two small birds, a small parakeet and a black and yellow hang nest. They flew onto our shoulders, begging for titbits, and we were slightly unsure as to the correct way of behaving under these circumstances. We were a little slow in selecting morsels from our plate for the birds. The parakeet, therefore, decided to dispense with ceremony, perched on the rim of Jack's plate, and helped herself. The hang nest adopted a different procedure and gave Charles a severe peck on the cheek with her needle-sharp bill to remind him of his responsibilities. Connie, however, soon put a stop to this, chased the birds away, and provided a specially cut-up meal for them in a saucer at the far end of the table. That's what comes of breaking the rules and feeding pets at the table. Your guests, your guests are pestered, she said. Can you imagine that, being pestered by birds while you eat? As dusk fell at the, uh, towards the end of the meal, a colony of bats began to wake up in the storeroom and leisurely and silently flit across the living room and out into the evening to begin hawking for flies. There was a scrabbling noise in the corner. Really, Tiny, said Connie severely, we must do something about those rats. Well, I did, replied Tiny, a little hurt. He turned to us. We had a boa constrictor living in the passage, which used to keep the place absolutely free from rats. And then, just because it once frightened one of her guests, Connie made me get rid of it. And now look what's happened. I want to end with that thought. So your way of preventing yourself getting rats if you're living out in the jungle there was to have a, a boa constrictor living around the house, which would eat all the rats. Anyway, look up boa constrictor, look up those birds, like the parakeet and the, and the hang, what was it called? The hang something as well. You can check back. Hang nest. There it is. And see them for yourself. In the meantime, thanks for watching. We'll pick this recording up and we'll see what happens when they go off looking for more animals. Goodbye.